if I can welcome um, Alicia Truma, um, who has been involved in customs and trade facilitation work since 1993. Um, he has worked with the Zimbabwe Department of Customs and Excise between 93 and 2001. He joined the Zimbabwe Revenue Authority from 2001 to 2010. Um, he's been since involved in quite a bit of um, cons um, consultancy work. Um, he's also got a few degrees, um, a degree in fiscal studies from the National University of Science and Technology at Zimbabwe, and he's uh, will be graduating in a Masters of Commerce and has ambitions for a PhD. <laughs> so I would like to welcome you. Let me take this opportunity to express my gratitude to INCU and the State Customs Committee of the Republic of Azerbaijan for organizing this value adding conference. I appreciate the spirit of hospitality shown by the host. I am actually enjoying every minute of my stay here and I'm really feeling at home. My presentation here will be about uh, the challenges and the threats from the perspective of the private sector in developing countries. I come from Zimbabwe, which is the, in Southern Africa, and is a member of SADAC and the COMESA. And the, many of these countries in SADAC and COMESA had actually acceded to the revised Kyoto Convention, where we actually started to have a feel of what is to come since uh, the majority of the provisions in the RKC are contained in the Bali Trade Facilitation Agreement. The private sector is not a homogeneous group of people. We have got uh, different sectors making up the private sector and uh, with the different, with the different interests. We have the retailers who are just there to import and resell. We have got service providers, and you also have the, the manufacturers. These various groups of uh, people, when they look at this trade facility agreement, some they see opportunities, while these, uh, others are actually seeing threats. According to a study by Boyenga and Kriva, Africa suffers from the highest customs delays in the world. It may actually take up to 12 days to clear consignment, and you might have to deal with about 30 board agencies. You may need up to 40 documents to be processed, and about 200 data elements, 30 of which will be repeated 30 times. So it's good news that is the trade facilitation agreement and other initiatives in the RKC are there to improve all of this. The other part of the private sector is in total agreement with the findings of the International Trade Center, the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement, a business guide for developing countries, as it explains many, many of those benefits which will accrue to the private sector. Some of the opportunities or some of the uh, benefits for the private sector in the developing countries has to do with uh, an expectation in the increase of intra-regional trade. This is expected to come from the reduction of cost of doing business. According to FESATA, the track-weighting cost at a border post in Southern Africa ranges from $250 to $500 per day. These are US dollars. So once there's more efficiency in custom services, there's a, that high expectation in the reduction of all this cost. There is a, also a benefit which the private sector will enjoy from the implementation of the Bali Agreement on Trade Facilitation. There's that provision on transparency which will also assist the businesses in developing countries to plan. Currently, from where I come from, 
we have already implemented the, the uh, school Dawe Road, the ICT in in the customs environment. The business has already started enjoying the benefits. They can now pre-clear. And uh, even as I stand here as a consultant, I can actually run my business in Zimbabwe from here because uh, I, I can now have access to legislation on, on internet. I can receive inquiries from my clients, refer to legislation on the internet, and make representation to my local customs administration. That has actually reduced uh, the cost of doing business on my party. Another benefit or opportunity which is coming to the private sector in a developing country, this will provide an opportunity to reduce poverty. That's according to the study by Repel. It says the reduction of trade costs will lead to, to an increase in the competitiveness of the firms. And uh, this efficiency should also resulting in improvement in export performance. And once a performance, performance, ex, ex, performance export performance has been improved, there will be more jobs being created, more income generation, leading to economic growth and poverty reduction. However, there's another side to that coin. The manufacturers are also saying the trade facilitation agreement may actually increase the poverty in uh, developing countries. The argument is that uh, what were the assumptions which were considered to conclude that uh, this trade agreement will actually reduce poverty. Which happens first, infrastructure improvement or implementation of the trade facilitation agreement initiative. Because the, besides the, the challenges that we face at the border post, manufacturers have got other challenges beyond the border issues. What are the real causes of poor export performance in developing countries? From the manufacturer's viewpoint in the developing countries, they are saying trade facilitation is actually liberalizing trade. The borders are being opened. So if developed countries are going to flood markets in developing countries with their goods, while at least blocking exports from developing countries through phytosanitary and technical standards, what effect will that have on the manufacturers in developing countries and the poverty levels? Let me now move on to To the threats, as I have said, the, the private sector is, a, is a, not a homogeneous group. I have discussed the threats as perceived by, by the manufacturers. The, there are also service providers who are actually seeing a threat in this trade, in this trade facilitation agreement. These are the customs brokers. In Africa, in most of the countries in Africa, it has been mandatory to use the customs brokers as the clearing agents to do the transaction on behalf of exporters or importers. Article 10, paragraph 6 of the trade facilitation agreement deals with the use of customs brokers. For example, in Zimbabwe, we have about 320 companies with an average of 10 employees each, making an estimated number of 3,200 employees. So when this issue becomes liberalized, so that traders are freely to transact with, with the customs administrations, these clearing agents, customs brokers, are actually seeing a threat in the form of closure of firms and the loss of employment. Another threat, as I've explained earlier on, is the, if the issue of NTBs 
by developed countries, discourages exports by developing countries into their, into their territories, poverty is going to increase. We are going to actually have a, an opposite effect of what we anticipate to get from the trade facilitation agreement. We also have our own implementation capacity challenges. Yes, I've talked of the introduction of a skewed world in Zimbabwe. But uh, we also have connectivity uh, challenges. For, ex for example, in Churundu, only at a single border post, we had a total of 512 hours downtime of, of the system due to electricity challenges and the uh, internet challenges. And uh, this resulted in an, in an estimated cost to business of 6.4 million dollars. So we still have those capacity challenges in implementation, which, which actually goes beyond the border, the, border, the border issues. It is also it's expensive, or the cost of production in developing countries is far much higher because of less inefficiencies. So the manufacturers actually feel that uh, once the borders are opened, there will be an influx or a flood of foreign goods to the detriment of their, their companies. However, there have been initiatives to make sure that this trade for certain agreement will actually become a reality, building on from what has been happening under RKC. On 2 May 2014, Kenya launched its national single window system in Kenya. And again, we have got uh, many stop border posts, one stop border posts being opened in East and uh, Southern Africa. Some of these are still work in progress. We have the use of ICT, which is also taking place in Southern Africa. A good example is the interface of these those systems. Minutes between South Africa and, uh, and, Squ and Squatchland in such a view that uh, Squatchland will be in a position to view the exports coming from Squatchland. And uh, there's active pri private sector awareness taking place in, in Tanzania. My recommendations to the perceived threats or perceived or real threats coming from the manufacturing sector of the private sector are that developing countries, as developing countries, we should continue to engage developed countries on the issues to do with the phytosanitary and technical standards. As the private sector, we should also continue lobbying and persuading our governments to put in place FDI attractive policies so that we may actually end up having foreign investors coming to manufacture in Africa so that it, at the end of the day, you should be in a position to manufacture goods which meet their standards for export to their, to their markets. We should also try to persuade and the our governments to implement WTO trade policy review recommendations so that uh, everyone, every member of the private sector enjoys the benefits which will come by, or which will be facilitated by the Trade facilitation agreement reached in Bali. I thank you. Would anyone like to raise some questions? Thank you for that uh, really interesting um, uh, talk. Um, I'm very interested in. Uh, one of the points that you raised, which is, as far as I know, not covered in the agreement, um, but nevertheless is a significant trade facilitation problem in Africa. You mentioned Churundu border post, the one-stop border post in Churundu, which is another area of very interesting debate um, in Africa. But the one thing that you mentioned was the sort of breakdown in... Uh, in uh, um, connectivity or, or electricity. And I, I've noted many times in, uh, in my work in Africa that electricity is a huge problem 
for trade facilitation that nobody's addressing. Um, there are problems with generators that don't have fuel. There are, there are, there are backup generators for uh, mains electricity that doesn't uh, 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 that it is inconsistently applied. Um, are you aware of any solutions that are on the way? Is the private sector able to um, contribute by partnering with government to, for example, start putting solar panels on the roofs of border posts throughout Africa? Um, I was speaking to a, a solar panel manufacturer at uh, Maputo Airport a few weeks ago, and he's delighted with the, the prospect of doing that kind of business. He was in Maputo putting solar panels on the roofs of places in the city. And I said, well, why don't you put them where they're needed most, out on the borders? So it, it's a really interesting area of trade facilitation because of the delays that you talked about. We have enormous delays because of electricity problems at borders in Africa. Thank you. My answer to the question on the alternative source of energy is that uh, certain countries have actually started taking measures to install solar panels at the border posts. And one, of, one example is Zimbabwe. At Chirundu? Yes, they were done. Okay. If there's no more questions, then I would like to thank all the speakers. <laughs> Sorry, I, my eyesight is not the best. My obstetrician says I need new glasses. <laughs> Sorry, did somebody put a hand up? <laughs> okay. Thank you, Chairman. I try not to delay our lunch. Uh, congratulations, uh, uh, the speaker. I just want to uh, flag uh, an issue that you raised in the presentation, and that has to do with the issue of managing trusts uh, in the relationship between uh, the private sector and customs. Well, as a fellow African, you know that the issue of uh, compliance is uh, a very big issue in Africa, and trust is at the center of this. As a former customs officer, uh, who is living in uh, the other side of the divide as a broker now. What are you telling your colleagues in the private sector on the issue of managing trust? Are there periods when you get tempted to cross to the other side and tell your former colleagues about certain practices in the private sector? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, the problem actually lies from both sides. And the, as a former customs officer, now practicing in the private sector, I at times regret the decisions that I used to make when I was a customs officer. Because you find out that in most cases in Africa, we recruit officers made straight from school without any particular experience from from the private sector in appreciation of how it, it works. Then my target was to raise revenue. It makes so many seizures. I would really care what, what, what would have been the effect uh, thereafter. So there is need for both sides, in my view, to have mutual respect, to start respecting each other. And it's not all clearing agents or customs brokers who are, who are corrupt. I can confidently say the setting is actually changing. We now have uh, clearing agents who have started to run their business professionally, and some are even upgrading their academic uh, qualifications, and they're now trying to run their business ethically. Actually, from Zimbabwe, I would actually recommend a situation whereby customs improves its involvement with the private sector, not with, with that uh, disconnect or mistrust, because we can actually offer you uh, solutions. We are in the field, we know what is happening. But if you try to think, if you see any clearing agent as a criminal, then we will still have a long way to go. So I'm trusting my glasses now, so no more hands. <laughs> I would like to thank all speakers. Um, <laughs>